Yes, we uh, started the Lake 227 experiment in 1969. At that time, the big controversy was uh, whether carbon needed to be controlled to control eutrophication. And the reason why that was thought is that there were a number of experiments done in small bottles that always showed that algae were carbon limited. Lake 227 had the lowest dissolved any organic carbon of any lake that had ever been studied. So we thought it would be interesting to add phosphorus and nitrogen and see if uh, it would keep from becoming eutrophic uh, because of carbon limitation. What we found is that it did not and that the bottles were giving us spurious results. Uh, the reason was, of course, that uh, small bottles uh, don't allow the same exchange of oxygen with the atmosphere as a whole lake, and it turned out that uh, the lake was getting all of the carbon it needed from the atmosphere in order to produce algal blooms, even though in small bottles they were always carbon limited. Once uh, we had demonstrated that, uh, we did another experiment in Lake 226 where we separated the lake in half. It was a lake uh, shaped like uh, a figure eight. And we put a curtain at the narrow spot at the waist of the lake. And we added nitrogen and carbon to both sides. But to one side, we added phosphorus as well. And of course, the lake turned bright green within a matter of a few weeks. Uh, the uh, implication was that uh, phosphorus was the culprit, and the lake with just nitrogen and carbon remained in a more or less pristine state, although over a period of, of several years it increased slightly in biomass, not because of the algae responding to nitrogen and carbon, but because uh, phosphorus was slowly leaking through the curtain. That, of course, uh, was the picture that uh, got a lot of people in lakes starting to reduce phosphorus. And it's been very successful in lakes. Uh, I've found 30 or 40 different case histories now where uh, reducing the inputs of phosphorus uh, slowly allow lakes to recover. Sometimes it's actually rapid, but typically where phosphorus returns from sediments, it takes several years for that internal source of phosphorus to wind down. But in every case that's been studied long enough, uh, it does eventually wind down. Sometimes it takes uh, 15 or 20 years. Well, this Lake 226 had an interesting difference from 227. In the early experiment that I just described, Lake 227 had been dominated by more or less the same species assemblages that had been there in the first place, just higher production of some of the common species. Whereas in Lake 226, we had uh, a near instant bloom of nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria, commonly called blue-green algae. And on thinking about the difference, uh, in Lake 226, we had added nitrogen to phosphorus at a ratio of only four to one, where in Lake 227, the ratio had been 14 to one. So in one case, uh, the uh, algae were nitrogen limited, whereas in the other, they were phosphorus limited. To test whether that was a trigger for these nitrogen fixers, I cut the nitrogen ratio uh, to phosphorus in Lake 227 after five years at the higher rate. And we got nitrogen fixing blue-greens almost instantly. That was back in 1975. And we, since then, have tested that theory uh, in several other lakes at the Experimental Lakes area. And uh, to summarize, a lot of papers, whenever we supply N to P at a low ratio, we get nitrogen fixers. And there are a lot of misconceptions 
in the literature. Uh, it's crazy, they be become so pervasive. Time after time, people state that, well, nitrogen fixation can't possibly supply all of the nitrogen uh, that the algae need. And the simple answer, which we've shown in a paper in 1987, is that they don't need to. What others have forgotten is that uh, uh, nitrogen, after being fixed, sediments with the algae it's fixed by. So that each year, some of the previous year's fixation uh, is sedimented and then recycled from sediments. And we found that uh, in Lake 227, at constant loading, uh, it took 14 years for nitrogen to increase uh, to near redfield proportions uh, to the phosphorus. But the whole time it was phosphorus that was driving the algal blooms and we were always getting algal blooms in, uh, in uh, proportion to the phosphorus. As a final extreme test, uh, in 1989, we cut off the supply of nitrogen entirely. And uh, since then, which is over 20 years now, the lake has maintained its eutrophic status and there has not been a statistically significant change in the biomass of algae in the lake. It stays nitrogen limited in summer and uh, typical limnologists with their little bottles or mesocosms, if they were to go to that lake uh, not realizing that we were fertilizing it with phosphorus, they do all of their little assays and find nitrogen limitation and they would be recommending that the lake has to have nitrogen controlled. And of course that's complete nonsense. It's not getting any anthropogenic nitrogen at all. So the change that we have to make is to stop thinking of nitrogen limitation as uh, meaning that nitrogen needs to be controlled. Instead, what it means is that the lake is over-fertilized with phosphorus. Since our paper, we now have several more years of data for the lake, and we have a, a very complete study with about 16 investigators of the entire nitrogen cycle. It's been suggested that uh, denitrification would sometime make the lake nitrogen limited. Well, it hasn't in 20 years. There is no nitrate in the lake and uh, as a result there's no denitrification. In fact, denitrification was low even in the early years when we were using a high N to P ratio. We have done denitrification experiments and added nitrate to lakes elsewhere. And in every case, what happens is that if there's nitrogen added in ionic form in excess of uh, algal demands, it's uh, uh, denitrified uh, once the concentrations of nitrate build up to about a millimole per liter. So uh, we, the demands that would be controlling nitrogen are built entirely on several cases of red herrings.